Okay, cool. We are live with a response video, and we are responding to the non sequitur show and their video or uh, question that Christians apparently cannot answer. And since all three of us are Christians, I think we'll give this a shot, and I think we're we're going to answer these questions sufficiently. So we have inspiring philosophy and deflating atheism with us. Great hey. YouTube apologies. Obviously, much better than myself, but uh. I IP went out chasing after the ice cream truck, I think, yeah. Oh, that's just in the background. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to head inside to you <laughs> listening to that. Are you using your phone or are you carrying a desktop yeah. with you? <laughs> yeah, I'm carrying a desktop with me. No, I'm okay. working on my, my biceps while I do this. Yeah, so let me uh, post a link here on social media and then we can start with a video. Well, I'll just lay the groundwork is that is that uh, a bunch of YouTube atheists made this video uh, uh, titled what what's it titled of uh, like 15 questions uh, Christians can answer. And yeah, so, yeah, basically that uh, basically the the punchline is that basically all of these questions had been answered by the year 1600. So, uh, uh, yes, they are eminently <laughs> answerable. Well, first of all, I mean. They were. I, they, I get it that it's tongue in cheek. They were. Yeah. Well, it's, were, it's provocation. It's clickbait. I get that. Yeah. No, they were. They they responded to a Christian video where they said these are a quick bunch of questions that atheists can't answer. But I hate when Christians and atheists do that. Everyone has answers to stuff, even yeah. if you think. I mean, I just debated those or, um, Mormons in the park. They came up and started talking to me, and they had answers, even though I thought they were ad hoc and plaus and implausible. Everyone has answers, so yeah. I, it's, I just hate when people label stuff like this. But I, I get that the video we're responding to was kind of playing tongue in cheek on the Christian when they first responded to. Yeah, yeah. So my friend from Instagram has just joined the stream. So why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, what up, guys? Hey, hey. can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Oh, okay, here we go. Uh, and just yeah, I just uh, hang out with JD online with like Instagram and stuff. So so yeah, and he he did a couple of videos. Yeah, so, <laughs> which uh, I liked. So I'll, we're going. I'm going to screen share now so we can unfortunately go through this video again. You know, I've seen it about twelve thousand times. Okay, yeah. Let's just start with the first question, and then we'll jump on to the next one. Yep. And, and praise, I think you're you're feeding back a little. So I think if you if you turn yourself down or, or mute your microphone when you're not talking. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay, can you uh, see the video? Yeah, I can. Yes. Yep. Cool. Uh, okay. Cool. Okay, so let's uh, start this. Is that wait? Is that too loud? No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's just keep going. Yep. Nice graphics. Make louder. <laughs> oh, louder? Yeah. Okay. We at Non Sequitur reached out to some of the best atheist content creators here on YouTube. If God is going to be positive for an explanation for human existence, then by what mechanisms, meaning by what activities and interactions that are organized in such a way that produced God use, and by what means could we discover those mechanisms? Okay, okay. Uh, who, who wants to tackle this first? All right, easily. A biogenesis and theistic evolution. I, or, I mean, if I'm a theistic evolutionist, then the mechanisms are abiogenesis and evolution, specifically structuralist evolution. I don't, I don't see how that's a, a hard question we can't answer. I mean, I, I don't, whatever. That's, that'd be my quick response because I'm not going to disagree with anything on, on that. So um, I think he was more asking, or this is a question that I'll uh, comes up is how does god create things or how is god well what are the mechanisms of god i think this is just a category error something is ascribed to god which cannot be ascribed to him because it seems god is made up of parts like you know a car or physical things yeah. and i i think that's just to beg the question and so on so on 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 science itself if you're asking for you know how could um how could the scientific method i guess discover god I think you would have to rely uh, heavily on predictions and so on, because obviously God uh, events like, you know, miracles and so on are not repeatable. Like, I think we find a fine tuned universe or the beginning of the universe, ex nihilo, or libertarian free will and so on. 
I think those would be good indications that theistic God exists. Yeah, it, it, it would be a rational inference at that point. It's the, we don't we don't have to abide by any sort of arbitrary stricture where the only inferences we can make are, are, are scientific in nature. Uh, I actually did not catch his question again. I think you should turn the volume up to a hundred. But uh, if if his question was like, what makes uh, God's will effective? If I heard well, IP, what, what are the mechanisms of God and so on? And oh. I, IP, I think I answered. You know, how did God create humans and so on? Yeah. Problem, so. Well, I, I do hear the question sometimes, like, why is God's will effective? It's like, okay, well, you could pose that as a philosophical problem. It's not any less of a problem for atheists if you could ask what makes the laws of nature effective. I mean, it's it's not, not a particular problem for theism. Yeah, it's an interesting question, but again, I don't necessarily have an answer of how God creates things in the sense of um, ex nihilo, because I think it's just a category here, and there may not be an answer. But I, I would also ask the question of how does matter take up space? And uh, some suggest uh, uh, it's some theorem where matter expands. But if I just ask how does that do that, again, this, this, yeah, this it's, infinite it, it's partially it's an infinite regress. And yeah. if you need to have an explanation of the explanation, then you get nowhere and science is destroyed. So while it's an interesting question, I don't think it, it's one that affects the existence of God or you know our arguments for his existence and so on. Okay, uh, could you turn the volume up to 100? Because I yeah, yeah I, I just did. Last one. Um, do you have anything to add? I am that I am. Yeah, and, and praise you, you're still muted. Yeah. Oh, okay, but is, am I buzzing still? or? No, that's good. Oh, okay, yeah, I was just going to say, like, you know, solipsism. It just comes down to solipsism anyway, so it just becomes circular if they want to um, appeal to their own, um, you know, interpretation of reality, so. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I think what you're getting is, like, they're, what kind of, they're kind of assuming that a dualistic approach here, that God is immaterial, right. the, the world is material, these are two separate oh, okay. substances, how would they interact? Yeah, they need a criteria. Yeah. You know, if you're an idealist, yeah. you know, an idealist and it's all one, you know, like I am myself, and it's all one substance, it's all one. They're all everything's are connected, so you wouldn't separate the two and have to have some sort of like weird mechanism in there on an idealist account. I mean, you know, people like uh, Bernardo Castro have written up dozens of papers on it, but this just this is the question specifically is on how to create humans. So, I mean, I don't get to go further right. beyond that. His well, question was not clear, and I was not well reported. Yeah, um. So I think it's my favorite question to answer because it's more interesting than the others. But uh, let's go on to genetically oh, modified. Crazy, you're feeding back again, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead and mute yourself until. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the second question here. Among even the most fundamentalist of Christians. Can Can you hear that, uh, Rob? Yeah. Yeah, it's still quiet. Hmm. It, it may be something on your line then, or let Let me see if there's. Oh, it's just the way it's recorded. Yeah. yeah, I can hear it just fine. Okay. There are always people who interpret some part of the Bible metaphorically. Like in the book of Job, they talk about the four corners of the earth. It's not Job. Fundamentalist Christians, for the most part, interpret that as metaphorical because we know there are no four corners of the earth. So when we find something in the Bible that doesn't necessarily reflect fact when interpreted literally, how can we definitively tell that that was intended to be interpreted metaphorically and not literally and is actually a falsehood? I, I, let, let me just say, uh, uh, four corners of the earth is not a metaphor, it is a figure of speech, and, and more importantly, it is a figure of speech that we still use. So you can't just talk about how, how these figures of speech figure in, in biblical Hebrew, I mean, these are questions we need to answer with modern spoken English. Now, if you're just going to be, I'm sorry, I hate to use the word, but just like completely autistic and not understand what's supposed to be figurative, what's supposed to be literal, what, what's a figure of speech. I, I mean, I, we can't hold your hand through all of this. Uh, well, I, I love how no one ever does this with Shakespeare. How come, how come there are metaphors in Shakespeare and there are literal passages in Shakespeare? When we're reading these, sto these stories, how are we supposed to know which is literal and which isn't? Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe we should study the text and the speak for itself. I mean, when it comes to the Bible, it's called hermeneutics. We yeah. study each passage. Yeah. We study the context. If we're reading a passage that contains 
Hebrew three-line poetry, clear metaphors, similes, figures of speech. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's it's called hermeneutics. It's this slippery slope fallacy is absurd. Just because there's metaphors in the Bible, like there's metaphors in every book written except for maybe the phone book. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't mean that we can't read it and understand what's saying. It's this idea that if I'm going to read John 15, one where Jesus says, "I am true vine," and I'm going to interpret that, oh, Jesus is using that as sort of like a metaphor. Well, yeah, that means we have to take the resurrection and the ascension all as metaphor. I mean, come on. Yeah, let's use or, a little or, common or sense when... to start out with. And yeah. the way we can do some hermeneutics and exegesis, study the scholarship on it if we're having difficulties with the passage. There are plenty of scholars who've written about this. This is not complicated. Yeah, and um, I guess Jesus would be a literal door if we also take that as liter literal. And I think the parable, by definition, is not a symbolic saying. But see, this question can literally be applied to anything they say concerning um religious or a atheistic texts and so on. Just the, the word exegesis is basically finding out what text always meant and what never meant. So text not mean what never meant. So it, in in the specific case of Job, this is Jewish poetry along with the Psalms, um, Ecclesiastes, and so on. The the, the uh, well, with poetry you have metaphors or figures of speech like Rob talked about. And well, when you have a book like the Bible written over a fifteen hundred year period. 66 books with 66 different authors you're, you're gonna have different types of styles and if you're not willing to figure that out by yourself then i don't think you're seeking sincerely with a sincere heart and so on yeah it's funny when, when you read uh, uh job as poetry it's just gorgeous poetry and when you actually read uh, the verses in context it's it's undeniable that these are, are meant in a poetic sense i mean i mean it's funny when they when they you know pull out like a phrase like foundations of the earth and, and then use that. Oh, well they're, they're make, trying to make a cosmological scientific point with the uh, foundations of the earth. When you read it in context, it's pretty clear that it's meant in, in a poetic sense. Uh, I like, I like what IP was saying about, uh, 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 you know, a atheists use uh, uh, metaphors too. What if, what, when Richard Dawkins said that uh, genes are selfish, did he, did he really mean that uh, uh, yeah. you know, they're envious? I mean, I don't, yeah. Yeah, the answer to this one is, is common sense. Yeah. Like, if you're going to read any other book, like Richard Dawkins' books or Shakespeare, and understand there are metaphors, there are lines that are meant to be literal, then we can do the same here. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah. Don't try the slippery slope fallacy. Yeah. And um, anything you would like to add on? I am yeah, it's just like the Bible is not a, like a scientific book. It, that seems to me it's like incredul incredulity to me with that. So. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. yeah, well, um, there could be a scientific fact in it, like the beginning of the universe and so on. Right, yeah. Yeah, it could be. I mean, they can mention them off the cuff, but it's not what it's aiming for. Yeah. yeah. So let's uh, move on to this question, which is about asked three other times besides this time. What are your reasons for not being a Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or follower of one of the many other non-Christian faiths? Is it because you've devoted enormous time and energy to systematically investigating and debunking all these other religions? If you yes. haven't done this, how can you in all honesty claim that your religion is superior? And if you're only a Christian because you happen to have been born into a Christian family, Jack Valsi. raised in a culture or society where Christianity is commonplace, what about all the other people who, by a twist of fate, have been raised believing one of the many other religions that God has allowed to proliferate? So, Kyle asked me to come up with... Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, who, who, who wants to start with this, man? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think it's funny that... that I, I really think uh, uh, 10 or 12 years into the new atheist revolution, this is, is really the – seems to be the argument they're hanging their hat on at this point, is if, if you were born in India, you'd be a Hindu or something. You know. yeah. uh, and the response to that is always, if you were born in India, so would you. Yeah, exactly. Or, or if, you, if you were born in Stockholm or Seattle, there would be a good chance that you'd be an atheist. So, I mean, I mean, does that invalidate atheism? That's the thing. It's it's self-invalidating, basically. Well, first of all, 
Yeah, uh, to answer this, yes, I actually have spent time reading the Quran, Muslim apologists, as well as Hindu scriptures. I've um, some of the uh, Zoroastrian scriptures. I've read Jewish apologists that kind of Christian apologists. So yeah, I have spent a lot of time reading about a lot of these other religions. The reason I'm a Christian is the evidence for the resurrection. That is flat out numerous times. Yeah. The evidence is really strong for Christianity. You don't see it with any other religions. Even Anthony flew when he was an atheist before he became a deist. And there is far more evidence for the resurrection than any other uh, claims for miracles. So, uh, yeah, Godless we actually engineer do would something. disagree with you. What? I said Godless engineer would disagree with you. Obviously, he's a scholar. You know, yes. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> let's let's just ignore what the what the histor historical evidence is. Apply special standard to Jesus yeah. than we would for any other historical figure. But I digress. But yeah, there's just so much evidence. I did a six-part series on the amount of evidence. And to this, this, to this day, no atheist has ever offered a better explanation of all, the, all that data. They either just deny it, call me crazy, and just ignore it. So yeah. I'm sitting here all the day going, well, what are you going to do? I mean, here's my, here's my challenge. Give me a naturalistic explanation that can explain all these, these different facts that is less ad hoc, more plausible. And yeah, I, I would be happy to reject it. I kept challenging this for several to, for as long as I can go on and no one has provided me anything. So the reason I'm a Christian is the evidence. Yeah. And the, the, about four times I mentioned this in my article is the main test is internal consistency The you know, what would the Quran contradict itself, which I think it does concerning, you know, the revelation of the old Testament, and new Testament, which is surprising when you find out that a lot of, that technically you're supposed to accept the Bible has inspired by God too. That's why many Muslim apologists have to interpret or reinterpret many passages in the gospels as different. But at the same time, um, oh yeah. And whether it corresponds with reality, like did Christ actually, was Christ actually crucified and Islam claims not yeah, that he was not, which is obviously absurd. yeah false. And that's why they have to propose a swoon theory or he was never, or, you know, some, some Muslims would be like, well, Christ had a twin, you would, you would think that would be mentioned in the Gospels if that was true, but... Well, most and, of them don't have their own resurrection account. They don't have something that yeah, yeah. is... They can present evidence for, like Christians can with the resurrection. We can present evidence for this. I have eight pieces of evidence I presented. Yeah. So, I mean, and then I'm including the Shred of Turin, which I need to research more. But, I mean, there actually is some pretty interesting study published in journals about that. So I need to look more into that, though. And, and yeah. that, that's the thing. I, I just want to uh, say this is that if you have one piece of evidence, that is sufficient for a justified belief with, with no sort of a, a countervening defeaters that, that will cast that into doubt. If you have a piece of evidence, uh, you, you are justified in having a belief. Now, uh, that doesn't mean you have to find reasons why it's not every other possibility. If, if, if I see, if I, you know, look into my uh, you know coffee mug here and see you know see see what looks like coffee and tastes like coffee. I would be justified in believing it's coffee. I don't have to think about reasons why there is not soda in my cup or there's not whiskey in my cup. I have a reason to believe. I don't have to search out reasons to uh, uh, exclude every other possibility. Now I could be in error, but uh, I think it's ridiculous that we have to. It, it's it's advisable to investigate the world's religions. But it's, it's not necessary to discount them one by one to have a justified belief in Christianity. I believe in Christianity because of the evidence, both the evidence outside my, of myself and the evidence in my own life. Uh, that's, that's sufficient for a rational, justified belief. Yes, and uh, to end, to wrap up this question, I would just simply have to ask him is, um, have you gone through every religion and shown them all to be false? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I also want to say uh, he does throw this out. Uh, of course, the genetic fallacy. You yeah. only believe because that's how you were raised. Well, we could play the same game with you. We could say you only don't believe because it makes you feel good about yourself or whatever. But we choose yeah, not to play that game. Well, let's focus on the somehow, evidence. Let's not try to attack people based on what what we think they believe and why yeah. we think they believe it. Well, yeah, it's independent. You know. At one point, everyone believed the earth was flat, but just because at that specific time they all thought that does not mean that it was flat. That that, that would obviously be an ad populum, not genetic fallacy. But at that specific time, if you were to just say the earth is flat because you were growing up that way, then that's a genetic fallacy and so on. Hmm. And yeah. when they apply it to Christians. 
it, it, it's it's funny though is is that I I really do see this being the predominant argument such as it is of atheism is that you you yeah. only believe uh, uh, because you were raised that way or you only believe because you're afraid of death or whatever and and, and that's that's really what they seem to be hanging their head on. Uh, uh, it's sad, years. but I see it more often too. It's sad, but I, I see it more often than I yeah. want to. It's, well, it's like, guys, come on. Let's talk about the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, anything you want to add on? Yeah, it's it's still a category fallacy too because they're lumping all religions into one. Not all religions are the same. They have different historical value, you know, epistemological value, ontological. Yes, some some religions do not even posit a, a god. So some right, religions yeah. are atheistic. So there you go. Yeah. So uh, I think we answered that, even though we're going. Come across it about five more times in this video. It's going to take four hours at the rate we're going. <laughs> so, because you don't understand it. So I decided to go with the supposed resurrection of Jesus Christ and the reason why he had to die in the first place. Here's my question. Why would an omnipotent, all-powerful God need a human sacrifice in order to forgive people their sins? If this being is truly capable of doing anything, has unlimited power and resources, and is all-loving, why would it require a brutal torture and killing? Why would it need a blood sacrifice and not just simply forgive people their sins, especially if it knew their motivations and could judge people according to their intentions? This question has always baffled me, even when I was a Christian. Anyhow, thanks for inviting me to take part in this video, Kyle. Cheers. All right. Okay, so um, why did Christ have to die, essentially, is the question. Why can't God just forgive people? Because first off, he's God, and he doesn't go down to petty human standards and so on. Yeah, I think this is actually the best question in the video. I think yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. a it's good so question funny. to ask. Because this is actually when I was an agnostic for the a few years that I was, this is one of the things I'd bring up um, and reading you know, a lot on them. So I think, first of all, theologically, there's a lot really cool explanations regarding like Yom Kippur and uh, the priesthood and book of Hebrews. But I think what he's asking more is um, philosophically, why would God want to do it this way? And I think uh, the point is to, you know, go through analogies. If we were to visit a country and there was a king, we saw people committing rape and murder and running around doing you dropped out. Uh, why are you letting this happen? You're dropping out, man. Said, no, it's okay. I don't need to do anything. I forgive them. We'd be like, you're not a good king. You have to do something about the evil. Mm. And so I think what the point is, like, what is he asking? Is he just saying that evil just go and God can just let it go without actually bringing a solution to it, actually providing something for it? This needs to be addressed. And, of course, this whole idea comes from the old Touch by an Angel show from the 90s that God has to come down to this guy and say, listen – I can solve your problems. You, you need to stop being so selfish. You, you need to stop being greedy. And we all need to just hold hands and sing kumbaya. That, that works in fantasy land, but in the re real world, people have to be shown their sin. They have to be shown how evil they are. And the only way you're going to do that is if you see what your sin causes, if you see what it deserves, what it's, what it's actually doing. And nothing will do other than the sacrifice of Christ. It shows us the pure evil that has to be paid. It shows what it caused. If going back to my original analogy, if a king said, okay, I'm going to take care of all this pain, but instead of punishing everybody because I'll kill everybody off, I will show you, I will take the punishment that you all actually deserve. And, and he went, he went through the horrible punishment, suffered and died. That would affect people. People would see, this is what I deserve. This is what my sin does. So if you see yourself as a sinner, unfortunately, a lot of atheists really don't. So there's kind of a block there between us and them. When they you see... Yeah. If you see what Christ had to suffer, if you see what that's what our sin deserved, that's and he took that for us, that is going to cause the change that is necessary. That is going to awaken people. This is a, a video I did a long time ago called Why Christianity is Different. And it's just a short five minute of Tim Kelly. He kind of goes more into this about how Christianity is different because of cross, of the sacrifice. It shows people their true evil. It shows people what their sin does, and it gives them the power to, to truly change through sanctification. Yeah. 
and, and I think I, I think in, in such a way that it really made sense uh, uh, for the pagans and Jews of the time. Uh, I'm I'm reminded. Uh, I just kind of thought of this uh, off off the top of my head, but of of uh, the Grand Inquisitor and the Brothers Karamazov, and he talks about the uh, the landowner who who sicks the uh, the dogs on the child, and 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 he says, well, when when they all get to heaven, you know, it's possible the child can uh, forgive the landowner. It's possible that his mother can forgive the landowner, but, but how can uh, uh, the mother ever forgive the landowner for, for what he did to the child? So I, I think, I think kind of uh, the, the, the crucifixion kind of solves this problem because God is not sitting afar and, and, and forgiving uh, what I do to you or what you do to me because God put himself in, in the figure of a human being where he was subject to the evil of man and where he would be in a position to forgive us rather than forgiving each other for things that were not done to him. Yeah, and also the cross takes up elements to the problem of evil. A lot of atheists get mad because God allows evil to happen. Well, I mean, I remember like, quoting an author in one of his um, lectures where he says, you know, the cross sort of answers that because you know, the, uh, the rules of the world got together to pronounce judgment on God and saw that he already served his punishment. Here, Christ has entered into the world, suffering, taking the bite of evil along with us. It's not as if he's a distant God on a throne who doesn't care. Yeah. Here is God suffering too with us, relating to us, knowing what we go through, showing that he truly doesn't care. Do, I mean, what, what, do you want God to just sit up on a throne and forgive you? I mean, he doesn't. How do we know? How can we see the true love of God? How can we truly know he does care? Well, you know, actions always speak louder than words. Yes. I, I also think that we have to acknowledge, uh, even, even as we say this, there is tremendous uh, poetic power in ju just that the, the you know, he, he who through, you know, through him all things were made and somehow he was born in, in, in a manger and then got crucified and just uh, uh, were subject to all these uh, very degrading circumstances. There is uh, enormous uh, poetic power in, in, in that, in, in just, just the reality of that, you know? Yeah. The and cross I, is the I, answer to the problem of evil. Sorry, go ahead. That? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just yeah, going to say yeah. the cross is the answer to the problem of evil. Yes. This is something Christians need to remember when responding to that. Hopefully in, later this year I'll do a video on that, but I haven't had time yet. And the sacrifice overall, whether it be blood sacrifice or, um, you know, with Cain and Abel, that's to show how much you actually want to be forgiven, how much you care about what you've done and repentance and so on. And when we see the cross, Christianity is the one religion where God comes to man instead of man coming to God. Yeah. Sacrifice is what atones for his sin. And it's not just human. It's not just human sacrifice. It's literally God incarnate sacrificing himself for us. Of course, the Muslim would ask, how could God die and so on? But that's a whole separate issue. But at the same time, God did this so he would just be able to forgive us without a bloodshed. So that actually helps answer Godless Cranium's question even more because, well, and Vice Ryan mm -hmm. when we get to that as well. Yeah, I think that pretty much answers both of them, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, anything else to add? I am that I am. Yeah, it's just the um, the moral law of God is severe. I mean, he demands it because that's he's holy. He's way, he's way beyond our morality, you know. Um, so I just think that sin is death. That's just the way because that's the severe, the severe, the severeness of God and his moral character. Yep. Okay, let's go to the fifth question, which is basically the third question again. that have relationships with their believers and with their servants. Why do you feel like the relationship that you claim to have with Jesus Christ is somehow special or unique and somehow invalidates how all other believers feel about their gods and their connections with their gods? Because it's true. First of all, about uh, who's... This, I mean, you can't go... You can't read someone's thought. You can't just say, Look, I know all these other religious people are sincere. Well, we don't know. I don't try to get personal. I try to do evidence when I talk to people with religion. Second of all, even if they are totally true, they do have sincere relationships. I mean, maybe they, Christianity is not immune to the idea there are evil spirits at work. So it's not like we would just say, if you could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they truly do have this, I mean, sure. 
But I mean, read Michael Heiser, the book, we do not deny that there are other forces at work. So even if someone does say they have a truly sincere relationship with like their spirit guide, as some of the new agers will say, okay, fine. I don't necessarily believe that's a good relationship to have because I would question the origin of that spirit. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's essentially the question. How is Christianity better than other religions and how is it more valid than the other religions as well? And Again, I would just say, let's debate the evidence. Let's not talk about how someone is with their personal yeah. relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's the answer to this question. Again, again, I, again, my article I talk about internal consistency and whether it corresponds with reality and so on. Yeah, I think I think uh, human beings have a kind of natural sense of the divine, and, and and maybe it needs to be kind of shaped and molded in certain ways. But I. I don't think that they are failing to connect with the divine in, in, in worship. Oh, no, at all. I think that's just general revelation. Yeah. I think when they, when those who seek general revelation, I think when they hear the gospel, I think they accept it. Yeah. But, um, anything else to add on? I think, I think, IP, I think IP showed a video where like where children are born with an innate belief in God. And I yeah. think even atheists too. So I'm thinking it's more intrinsic uh, evidence that Christianity is real anyway. Yeah, well, well, the, there's the book of Born Believers that shows that we, we do have a, a kind of innate tendency tor towards towards God. And it's, it says in the Bible, it's, it's kind of written in our heart that, that you know, we're without yeah, excuse. Romans 2, 1 through 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, that doesn't mean that we, you know, it's not to you know, obligation of society to help uh, uh, guide them in a certain direction. Yep. Okay, we, we can move on to the next question because it'll probably take a little longer to answer. In the Old Testament, God didn't like all the unrighteous people on earth. So why did God choose to get rid of all of them with a global flood? Presumably, he could have made them painlessly vanish with a silent snap of his immaterial fingers. And why, after flooding the whole earth, did God decide to hide all evidence of his act? Why? I, I just love that guy, though. You, you have to admire his spirit. You know? <laughs> I've never seen. Oh, yeah. I've never seen a lot of these guys before. I just. I, I like yeah, well, his attitude. The the reason was is well, I believe in a local flood. For example, I so yeah, I actually I, think there well, is evidence of a local flood. Yeah. Uh, there's a book. The Lost World of the Flood, where they actually talk about a flood that happened around the Black Sea, uh, five thousand five hundred BC. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, I, I, I accept that model. I believe is that yeah, what so, the Caspian Sea and all those other seas in the Mediterranean Sea and so on. Yeah, it was a it was a catastrophic flood that happened around fifteen or fifteen or, or not fifteen five thousand five hundred BC. I'm gonna get my numbers right, and it's talk about it in the book, The Lost World of the Flood. I just interviewed Walton on my channel about this. So they talked about there actually was a local catastrophic flood in that region around that time. It happened suddenly. It didn't happen, you know, gradually like a lot of floods have in the past with the polar ice melting. But the, the main question seems to be a more philosophical. Why didn't God just snap fingers and remove everyone? Hey, his well, immaterial because, fingers. Yeah, well, first of all, <laughs> that would, A, remove the evidence. And we actually do have evidence of a local flood back then. So it's, it's B, second of all, the whole point was to show judgment to remove humans from the land, to reshape it in that way, because, you know, the, uh, for example, Eden talks about there were subterranean aquifers that were, you know, we have found in places like under the Persian Gulf or under the Black Sea that were filled in. Uh, so it was about remove humans sin so much that they could no longer have that land, which we can't trust you anymore with these, with these, with these rich areas. So we're going to cut you off entirely from it. So, although again, it, it left evidence. I've, if, as I've argued, I think that the text is talking about a local flood. Uh, well, I think that we actually have evidence of it. So there, yeah. there, there's evidence left for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I would just say that the flood was worldwide, not global, meaning that the world known at that time, the Mediterranean, where, you know, Alexander the Great conquered, a lot of that was flooded by that um, flood you talked about early, earlier before. Yeah, and the, um, book that they, the, the book they cite is by William Ryan and Walter Pittman. Said the book is called Noah's Flood and New Scientific Discoveries about the event that changed history. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have, check that out. Yeah, well, we do I'll, have scientific evidence of the flood. So there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it's it's always the luxury of the atheist to simply assert that there is no evidence for X. 
and, and, and they'll, they'll always demand that you satisfy them. But but yeah, still, they'll say there is... I, I saw a meme uh, that said that there is no evidence that any of the characters of the New Testament exist. It's like, dude, we know where most of these guys are buried. It's like, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, um, obviously the case for Noah is harder than uh, someone like Christ, obviously. Yeah, um, or I was talking about his disciples. Yeah, I mean, I mean we have yeah. like, the, bur the burial places for, for many of them. Yeah, and ISIS has, I believe, um, terrorized Paul's burial site and the disciple of John, I believe, as well. Yeah, but, um, which is horrible, by the way. But at the same time, concerning the flood, water in the Old Testament and New Testament is represented as washing away sin. And I, of course, I accept this as a historical narrative, whether global or local, in that sense. Uh, you, you can get um, a moral sense or a me let, me, let me say metaphorical sense here or figurative sense of the flood waters wiping away the unrighteousness that God saw and the righteousness of Noah by faith of allowing him to exist to start a new righteous generation and so on. Yeah, well, you're asking atheists to accept that something is both literally and poetically true. So, I well, mean, that's I don't know if they work on that level, but yeah. Um, anything else to add? I'm good. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, well, I meant from I am that I am. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I was about to say it's a straw man argument because, like, I think it was tra the, or the word earth erets in the Hebrew is, like, translated 3,000 times in the Bible or the uh, Old Testament, and, like, only 1% of it was worldwide, um, like, exegeted worldwide uh, context so it's definitely a straw man argument well yes I, I mean this is this is a, a point I made several times that again we still see this in in modern English we talk about the earth as in the whole world or the earth just as in the ground you could you consider right. that the the rain floods the earth and you're just talking about the ground beneath you uh, you will find it's debatable whether the uh, Hebrew Bible really contains any references to the whole world, but I mean, they talk about the earth, and so it's so very minuscule. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the question presupposes a global flood, which it, it, uh, it is more of a question for I don't want to say young Earth creationists, even though they typically go for the model of a flood. Even though I do know an old Earth creationist who argues for a global flood, but um. So, so, so from that, if you presuppose there was a global flood, then, you know, that would be a question. That would be their burden proof and not ours, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can move on. Yeah, even though this question is going to be the exact same. <sighs> the is that the believers in every religion in history were wrong about their respective religion, despite having the same amount of conviction and evidence as you do for Christianity. It seems to me that you're already an atheist when it comes to uh, all other religions. Uh, Somehow, the one you happen to be born into is the one correct. Well, shut up. <laughs> okay, first of all, there's not. I mean, it's even as I said, even as he flew, there's far more evidence for the resurrection than any other miracle claim. Yeah. So, yeah, no, yeah. you're wrong. You have to actually show that the, that for you, well, the Egyptians had the same amount of evidence as we did, or Muslims have. The, I mean, you just can't assert that ad hoc. Notice a common thread through all these religions besides Buddhism. There's some sort of supernatural reality. And you're the one claiming they're all equally irrational and stupid to believe in, so you have the burden of proof to show your atheism is correct and so on. So yeah. we believe one God further besides you, so... Well, that, that's the thing. Even if you're going to take the view, which of course is wrong, but the view that every religion is, is like 3,000 different mutually exclusive options... Well, he, is, um, a, you know, atheistic naturalism would just be the 3,000 and first mutually exclusive option... So uh, yeah. you just have the same exact problem, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's And considering whether I'm an atheist, even if I accept their lack of belief definition, it still doesn't help their position. No. Um, and there are plenty of people who, who arrive at religious beliefs that are different than their parents. So the entire premise of your question is bunk. And it, atheism, by its proper definition concerning... Uh, philosophy is the proposition that God or gods do not exist. So none of these religions are athe 
are atheistic in that sense. So, well, I, I would say I would say that there are religions. Like I would say Scientology is is an atheist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you 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 could argue you could argue that some forms of Buddhism are atheistic, but yeah, yeah. So, um, again, we we've already addressed this. Again, I third time test test the propositions of these worldviews, internal consistency, and corresponds to reality. Um, any, anything else? Yeah, I'd like to know, like, what makes atheists arbitrators of evidence? Like, what's like, what basis do they make that claim where they can de decide what evidence is? You know, and so that's all they do is like use the buzzword evidence. Yeah. Yeah, and try to impose it. But by evidence, I mean beyond a re beyond any doubt and absolute proof. So God appeared to me, but at the same time, they would say I'm hallucinating. Yeah, I, I mean, evidence is merely providing a reason to believe. It's not. It's not necessary to meet your burden of proof that someone else is convinced, because it's very possible a person will refuse to be convinced on any under any circumstance. So, yeah. Uh, so I think we can move on here. Powerful and all loving. Why does he require blood in order to grant forgiveness? Old Testament or new, something had to die before he could forgive anyone. Human beings can forgive each other without there being a death first. Why can't God? We do okay. really have to answer that answer that earlier. the premise of that question, yes. Yeah. We yeah. really have to answer it. We answered it earlier. So Yeah, I, I just <laughs> I just want to add one thing that I extended on in my uh, article here that I, I find helpful. So um, blood had to be shed because when sin entered the world, that obviously brought death into the world. So um, in order to make reparations for one's trespassings, a, a sacrifice of some sort, what, an atonement would have to be given of some sort, whether it be blood or, you know, um, giving one's life up for Christ, which is uh, essentially the message of Christianity. And again, Christ's sacrifice was to end this bloodshed, first of all. So if you accept Christianity, that this, uh, again, we, we won't accept that premise in the first place. And so what if humans can just forgive each other? How do you know How do you know it would be sincere? And since we know God did this at the cross, we know he is sincere when he forgives us and so on. I mean, we already kind of answered that earlier, yeah. pointing out. So, yeah. I mean, same so, basic question as earlier. Yeah, so we can just move on. Notice how she said corners of the universe. Uh, you should take the most <laughs> modified skeptic. Yeah, how dare she? Have? She clearly me must think the universe has actual corners because yeah, she said it. It can't be a map. Yeah, oh yeah. God, this is uh, awful. What a dumb question. Well, first of all, it's about evidence. Okay, I don't. You can't prove that materialism or atheism or naturalism is true. Whatever you're saying, you're hold to. But she thinks that's the best explanation of the data. She, I, I'm pretty sure she's a Christ mither. She, she can't prove Jesus did not exist, but she thinks that's the best explanation of the data. So why can't we have a best explanation of the data? Let me talk about the data we do have. Yeah, and um, I think there's a misunderstanding of what we mean by God. This is my definition of God. You guys may disagree, but I define God as the greatest conceivable being who is an unembodied mind that transcends space and time. If he was a being inside the universe like Greek pantheons, then he really isn't God. Because he's bound by space time, and uh, exactly. th th this presupposes God is the magical man in the sky, which is the false view, and that none of us hold, which is the biggest straw man by the new atheism. By the way, I I really anyway. don't even get the question. Like, of course, you that, can't. She can't prove she's not a brain in the vat. So what? Yeah. Like, no, she can't I, prove I, she's I, not a butterfly dreaming she's a woman. I mean, you can't prove a lot of things, but it doesn't mean you're going to believe it, or you're just going to always be questioning it. I mean, it's about the best explanation of the data. It's about the we can study the data and we can come up with the best explanation that we think is of reality. So well, that's what we're doing. Why don't we talk about that? Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think you're fully grasping the dumbness of the question. I think you're arguing at a higher <laughs> yeah, level. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would I would call you out for you for calling her dumb, but she, when, um, when I was debating Kyle Listen, that that skeleton in your life, isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think girlfriend or something like that. There, I'm I'm pretty. Well, sure. She called me an effing asshole during the break in between oh. our my debate with God's engineer shut down because I just before the break the the, the stream shut down, um, I 
I asked him if he was reading off Rational Wiki. And then he did. He said I, he was using it as a source, but it wasn't his only source. So I said, okay, good for you. But then she called me an effing asshole. I was like, <laughs> okay, lady. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I would call yeah, well, him. Well, I, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's such it, – it's even a straw man because I, when, when atheists use this definition of God, lowercase g, God – uh, it's just kind of this arbitrarily powerful being. I don't know how else you would. We're not talking about an arbitrarily powerful being. We're talking about the the creator and first cause of, of, of all every all created things. So there's a difference in kind there. There's not a difference in degree. And uh, we're not even necessarily committing ourselves to the premise that that Odin or Zeus or, or Poseidon don't exist when we say that we believe in Yahweh. Uh, so it's it's a complete non-argument, really. Well, yeah, actually, Thor exists because he 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 almost killed Thanos, but that that's a whole different story. But um, yeah. Oh, uh, spoilers! Spoiler alerts! I'm probably going to get a lot of Yeah, and Kim Jong Un exists, and he's he's <laughs> nod to the North Koreans. So yeah, Chris Hemsworth exists. Yeah, um, but up. Uh, yeah, and uh, again, just misunderstanding of what we mean by God and uh, a straw man question. And cats exist, and they were worshipped as gods by the Egyptians, so. Yeah, yeah. We're surrounded by gods, yes. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Um. Well, yeah, I was going to say, like, um, well, the cause of the universe demands an eternal um, cause. I don't see how they can um, get around that, you know, the, the monotheistic face. How can they get around that? So. Yeah, we'll get to that Alice Engineer's question, which is... By far my favorite, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> favorite, yes. Put that in quotation marks. So uh, we, we can move on to the next question here, which is the final time we're going to ask this question, hopefully. There are thousands of other religions out there, many of which have millions of followers. So according to your logic and theirs, anyone who is a blasphemer to your particular deity is going to be condemned, whether it is to go to hell or to be reincarnated as a less intelligent animal. If your god is true, why is it that he would even allow the minds of humans to be so easily deceived into believing other religions? He essentially would have created brains that can be fooled and ultimately will send these people down to hell. In addition, how do you know you're not one of the people who have been fooled? Truth doesn't feed... So, uh, someone can, you know, refute that easily? Yeah, evidence. And first of all, I, I, I'm assuming a fundamentalist view of hell, which I don't hold to. I hold to yeah, yeah. Services. Well, I, I hold to hell as separation from God, because obviously, if you if you're arguing for an immaterial reality, obviously, fire and light or fire and darkness. Uh, yeah, yeah. Our yeah it's the time space can't exist coexist in, in the same field and so on. I just don't understand why they, this question comes up so much. Just its variation. Like, do they really think this is a good path to take? Why don't why don't they ask us about what's your evidence? What do you think of this with the cosmological argument? How do you do with that objection? No, it's like, how do you know you're right? What about these other religions? I mean, guys, come on, let's 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 have a conversation about the evidence. Stop trying to, you know, psychoanalysis people's motives. Exactly, exactly. It, it, it is. It, I always say that the the atheists' uh, favorite sciences are the soft sciences, and so it's always BS evidence-free psychology and BS evidence-free sociology. Uh, uh, that's about all there is to it. Yeah, yeah, and again, I'll I would ask again. Um, how do you know? How do you, how do you know you're not convinced, or how how do you know you're not fooled, and how do you know they're all false, and so on? Yeah, well, it's it's very odd is that they they proclaim themselves the ex these exemplars of of reason and rationality and evidence, and yet here he is admitting that 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 human beings are very credulous and very easily swayed, which I agree is is certainly true. Uh, to answer to answer specifically that it's. Free will. First of all, people, uh, as David Hume said, your reason is and ought to be a slave of the passions. People want to believe what they want to believe. Yeah. I mean, that just well, it happens. They, they, the best we got to do is try to put our bias aside and try to follow the evidence. So let's just realize that we're humans. We're emotional. We're, we're rational and emotional. Probably more emotional, unfortunately. We're very fallible. Yeah. Let's try yeah. to put that down. And just debate the evidence. I mean. I but the atheists have already, have already determined that there is no evidence. That that is that is their article of faith is that there is no evidence. <laughs> so so they will refuse to debate that point. Trust me, I've tried. Yeah, well, without actually looking at it. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Oh, anything else you would like to add? I am. I am. No, you guys covered it. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I like the I like the poster on this guy's wall. A uh, dare to be curious. Yeah, why why you try investigating your article of faith that there is no evidence for God? Try try seeing if if that's true or if that that can withstand scrutiny. Yeah. Right, let's move on to the question then. Yeah. Curiosity testing or doubt, which inoculate us against charlatans and scams. But if your beliefs stand up to scrutiny. Then why is Downing Thomas vilified as the bad guy for utilizing the scientific method, while the rest of the disciples are congratulated for following like blind sheep? So in mode. Okay, first of all, they weren't. They um, they were not blind following. They actually had Jesus appear to them. Uh, so they had plenty of evidence. They had an empty tomb. The whole thing about Downing Thomas is not that oh believe on blind faith. Those are the good people. Yeah. Thomas had. Several witnesses telling him this. He had an empty tomb. He had he had enough evidence for it. The whole point about doubting Thomas is not believe on blind faith. It's look, Thomas, you've been given enough evidence, and even you are still not believing. How could you? You really need this. Think of all the people who are believing just on the evidence that that the that we have given in our in you know, my, my series on the resurrection, reliability of the New Testament, whatnot. So the the whole point is, hey, you've been given enough evidence. So blessed are those who believe based on the evidence that we've given them, not based on having have even more evidence, more goalpost shifting. I mean, Thomas had a lot of evidence he could look at. The disciples had evidence. No one was believing on blind faith. Yeah, uh, uh, Thomas doesn't, by far does not come off the worst uh, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the resurrection. Uh, I, they, it's funny, he did not use the scientific method. He used empirical evidence. He, he placed his finger in the wound. Just as as the other, well, that's, he's talking about before that. He's talking about before Jesus appeared to him. You know, he was doubting, and then Jesus appeared and convinced yeah. him type thing. Yeah, well, in, in both cases, it was empirical evidence. Well, he just they, had they, a kind of different threshold. The other d disciples weren't believing until Christ appeared to them as well. They they started to believe when Christ appeared. So they they were still using the scientific method, even though I don't. Think it's the yeah, same. well, it's not really the science. It's empirical evidence. I mean, we believe yeah. what our what our senses tell us. There's well, I mean, it's not it's not that you know th this is a passage about believing on blind faith. That's not what it's about. Yeah, it's because if you look at the context, Thomas had evidence already. He had eleven of his best the people he's been traveling with for years. Or, sorry, ten at that point traveling with him, telling him he has risen. By the way, there was also an empty tomb. By the way, there was also these women followers who said it as well. Look yeah. at all this evidence. Even the Jewish priests are admitting the tomb is empty. I mean, there's no – we he had enough data. So the whole point was not just believe just on my faith. That's not at all. That's I, I, nowhere in the book of Acts. It's no priest in the, in the Gospels. Jesus even says, believe on the evidence I've given you. Yeah. Every sermon in Acts, Paul says, believe on the evidence. Like we have witnesses. He, we have scriptures that can back this up. We have all this evidence to present to you people. Like his, when he's in – Athens, for example, he uses his uh, his appeal to testimonial. So yeah, there's there's always evidence. And, and most importantly, just to just to hammer this point home, nobody is vilifying Thomas. I'm I'm not really aware of anyone who vilifies Thomas. So uh, let me read the verses right after this passage that they like to quote for blind faith. Uh, this is John twenty thirty through thirty one, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but that these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So again, and if you keep reading the lines, you realize in context it's not blind faith. Mm. Yeah. So um, anything else? people would like to add on well yeah thomas did have spiritual revelation from christ too i mean he learned straight from like the the master himself so there's no excuse for that yeah yeah oh uh, okay so yeah we can just move on to the next question here sections of christian theology there's typically one of two afterlives you'll get into when you die there might be different subsects of this, but generally speaking, there are these main two ones, heaven or hell. So my question would be, why would you want either of those? Let me lay it out. You can either go to heaven and have no free will, or you can go to hell and burn forever. Take your pick. 
if you go to heaven, everything's happy at all times, which means you're not allowed to feel sadness. You'll be worshipping God until the end of days, and there's going to be no end of days, so it's going to keep going forever and ever, which means you effectively have no will of your own. You are forced to worship this deity until who knows when. Now, if you go to hell, then you're going to be burning forever, but at least you have your free will. <sighs> In neither of these are you given a choice or a chance to be anything but what you will be shaped and molded into. In both of these, you will effectively be a slave. Whether you have your free will and you're burning and tortured, or you have no free will and thus are effectively stuck in unending servitude. I don't believe either of these places exist, and I have no reason to believe either of these places exist. But it seems that a lot of Christian theists want these places to exist. And my question would have to be, why? Both of them sound absolutely abysmal. Okay, first of all, um, why does he assume there's no free will in heaven? Ever hear of the war in heaven? Yeah. You well, can't okay. have rebellious angels with no free will. Well, you, you gotta remember that's that's in Revelation twelve, and that's a past reference. And in the new heavens and new earth, there will be no tears, no mourning. I would just simply argue that free will is not choosing the options, but choosing between them, and evil won't be an option in well, heaven. The answer heaven to this is: Why won't we sit in heaven for the very same reason? I won't eat dog crap today. I have the free will to. I'm not going to because I know how terrible it is. Yeah. So it's like it's based on knowledge. It's not based on the fact that you won't have free will. It's based on the idea that you just will have been sanctified and been enlightened to the point where you know you wouldn't even want to do that at that point. And this idea that heaven is going to be boring, we're all just going to be worshiping God. First of all, Christian heaven is not some platonic place in the ether. It's the resurrection. It's here on earth. It's going to be this universe. So, I mean, I, I've talked about this a little bit, um, but not that much. But I believe that heaven is going to be turning the entire universe the Garden of Eden when we will have an eternity to spend doing that. And then second of all, it's also based on the idea that heaven is supposed to be selfish. It's supposed to be like a five-star resort where it's all about you. You can do whatever you want. And heaven is not about that. Heaven's about being sanctified to the point where you don't care about yourself. Yeah. You're too busy loving others and loving God. And you don't get sick of loving other people you really love. No one gets sick of loving their child. Yeah. And so it's going to just keep getting better and better the more that we love each other and the more others love us. That doesn't mean that you're a slave to loving your child. He, he's taking a matter of fact and making it a, a matter of necessity. Yeah, and we got to remember that why are people in heaven in the first place? It's because of their own free will in the first place. Yeah. So they've already chosen to do the greatest good, which is to trust in good himself, which is God, of course. And then hell is a rejection of God, essentially. Whether it's literal interpretation again, which I would argue that it's not based on again, hermeneutics and so on. And the people who don't want to be in heaven are the people who think heaven is all about themselves and you get bored of entertaining yourself. That's what sin is. It's where you so self-absorbed, you can't think of anything but yourself. And that kills you. That destroys your soul. Mm. When you focus on other people, that, that helps you grow. That makes you feel better. That's, a, that's why the Bible calls us to love one another. That's what heaven is. It's this total self-denial in loving other people and other people loving you back. It's the rejection of these self-absorbed desires that we have on Earth. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's essentially... And more on hell. It, finally, if, if, hell, if heaven and hell do exist, which obviously we believe they do, in the sense of um, not, not a literal interpretation of hell as being an eternal fire and so on, now, the torment could be described as inflicting pain, which is, you know, could feel like fire in that sense. That could be an analogy using there. But um, it, it, it won't matter what we think in the first place if, if they do exist. But my, my, my question would be to them is, why would you not want to be with God in all eternity? If, and if you say, I, I would never want to be with God, then, then God gives you up to your own desires, which is essentially what hell is. Hmm. I see Paul Ogia here has been working out. Yeah. Yeah, showing his white privilege. Yes, yes. Oh, and, and yeah, anyway, I'll add on. I am, I am. I am, I am. Yeah. Are you still there? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I would like to know how they came to the conclusion. What the, what, how the, how heaven is like. How the hell would they know what heaven's like? You know, <laughs> even That's Peter said, point. like, no eyes shall perceive or comprehend what heaven's going to be like. Even, and then Paul said, like. 
and second Corinthians 12, he, he, he says it's uncomprehensible. I mean, it's incomprehensible. You can't even understand it. So mm. I like that. there's no basis for what they're claiming. I, I believe uh, uh, Alvin Plantinga actually wrote extensively about, about free will in heaven. So I've, I've been meaning to kind of get into that, into that literature. It's, it's a kind of interesting subject. Yeah. So uh, I think we can move on to the next question. So um, I, I just want to say I love that when atheists mock Christians for using their personal testimony, but when they do it, yeah. their personal testimony about atheists, oh, that's that's a good argument. They can do that. It's just like such a double standard. Don't give me that. I don't know. I can't psychoanalysis you. Let's talk about the evidence. Don't give me this idea that, oh, I was – I really wanted to believe. I, I was struggling, but then I saw the light and atheism. And I just had to come – okay, if, if – if, uh, mock Christians in their personal testimony, I'm going to do the same to you. Let, let's not play that game. And, and it's worse because they'll take their own uh, personal experience and just project it onto everyone. You know, it's, yeah, like, it's like everyone like, must follow in their footsteps. That if they were a Christian and then they had doubts, uh, that is that is the inexorable progression is that is that if you investigate your doubts, you will end up as an atheist. Uh, I actually found it interesting. Shannon Q, uh, she was like asking you, why, why do you think it's bad – for us not to pretend to believe something that we know is a lie. It's like, could you ask a more loaded question? Well, they're basically yeah. saying, like, I know, I look, I'm really objective. I really wanted to be in, in Christianity, but I really studied the evidence. And so if you were, if you do the same, you will too. I mean, first of all, okay, let's actually talk about the evidence. Let's yeah. not talk about personal feelings. And second of all, psychologically speaking, I did a video called Is Atheism a Delusion? The title being tongue in cheek. Uh, look, there's actually a lot of psychology on this. It's really easy for humans to accept theism and really hard for the brain to accept atheism. So if you truly did want to believe and you truly do study the evidence, from a psychological perspective, it, I find it hard to believe that you end up at atheism at that point. Because psychologically, the brain does accept theism far more e easily. Yeah. And so when I, ask, when I give them the arguments like – cosmic conscious argument or the digital physics argument for God's existence, they'll sometimes say, well, that's just not enough evidence for me. I will always give them that video. And they're like, well, psychologically, it should be enough. So, okay, at the end of the day, can't psychoanalyze them. Let's stop relying on our personal testimonies and just use the evidence. This is the best they can do. This is the, this is the best they have. Yeah, and um, they, they say, can someone truly believe in something that they're not convinced of? Well, since they call us irrational for believing in God, because apparently we believe without evidence, by the way, that answers their own question, too. We, we, we would, of course, dispute that premise, too. Of course, they don't seem to realize these things. Essentially, can one choose their own beliefs? And I talked to Shannon. She says uh, no. So, it, again, I, I think she presupposes that we don't have free will and so on, which is a whole issue, which makes this entire no, I would, I would actually side with her. I actually side with her that we don't choose our own beliefs in that sense. We 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 either we either believe or we don't. I mean, we we can't you assent to propositions to be true or false. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. then that's what I mean by choosing our own beliefs. Yeah, I, I think we're talking about not, not choosing yeah. what beliefs are out there and so on. Of course, people like uh, Scientologists can make up this whole thing and believe in that, which I think would prove my case and somewhat. Uh, that 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 that's a whole different thing yeah uh, well I, I think it's enough to say that nobody is asking you to believe anything that you know not to be true uh yeah. that's just a complete straw that's just a ridiculous yeah. straw man so we reject we reject every premise of that question first off they need to cite what their standards of evidence is and if it's beyond any doubt then obviously you're not going to get that from god because he requires from some some kind of effort to you know 
put in for uh, whether he to answering the question whether Christianity is true or not, and to seek with a sincere heart. And if, if if you can't get past that, then I I don't know if you are. Yeah, I, I would actually just do even that if you get into like the ontological argument or something like that. But yeah, the, the basic point is just don't use your testimony, atheism or theism. Yeah, the, let's debate the evidence. I mean, come on. This I is also, not, I also not, do not believe that their personal testimony was sincere, but that's another question. Well, who who cares? It's, yeah. I mean, you, we can't know for sure because I can't get inside their minds. Yeah. Let's just let's just talk about the evidence. I I'm not going to use my personal testimony. They shouldn't use theirs. Let's talk about the data. End of story. Yeah. And again, it, it comes down to what should we assent to be the standards of evidence? Should it be beyond a reasonable doubt, which is my um, point of view on apologetics, which is a cute, cute app, evidentialism and so on, showing something to be beyond a reasonable doubt and to most likely be the case. I'm not a presuppositionalist in, in the sense of reformed theology, which is a... I like Jeff Durbin's presuppositionalism, but Saiten, Brut, and Kate, and so on, just annoys me. Yeah, well, I think you're. I think you're making it more complicated than it needs to be. <laughs> if you have a piece of evidence, you have a justified belief. If if you have no pieces of evidence, you don't have a justified belief. Now, I would whenever I try asking uh, an atheist about their own uh, articles of faith, like there is no evidence for God, they absolutely refuse to give me any pieces of evidence. Now, when they ask me about my Christian belief, I could provide them with all sorts of pieces of evidence. They may not find them convincing, but they don't have to because the stand, the bearing the burden of proof is merely to provide pieces of evidence. It's not necessarily to convince the other person because some people will refuse to be convinced by any amount of evidence. Yeah, yeah. And, well, re refusing seems to presuppose free will. So I, 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 I at the end of the day, to some extent, I think we can choose our beliefs. That's why I think there are people such as flat earthers. And well, we, we can, we can probably move on at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we we, we can move on, unless uh, I am I am has anything to add. You still there? Oh yeah, my bad. Uh yeah, I think this it's a pre it's a presuppositionalist pre argument. They presuppose this, you know, the scientific method. Well, that's circular because what do you, how do you verify the scientific method? So it just becomes circular. Well, they, they, no, I mean, they don't even presuppose that. They just presuppose that God is, doesn't exist. And they know this for a yeah, fact. Even yeah. though we know we can't ask them. If, why, why well, they, well, first, it's a lack of belief. And then it's the proposition that God does not exist and so on. Whatever is most convenient for them at any given time. <laughs> yeah. Arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah, so we we can move on. On with the show, this is it. Often, oh, dear. <laughs> the will characterize the Big Bang as something magically created from nothing. But then you have creationists who literally believe a supernatural being created the entire universe. Literally something magically from nothing. My question to you is... Why is the first one irrational, but the second one logical? Yeah, as I said, this is my favorite question. <laughs> so he's literally telling us it's far more ra – it's, it's just as rational to believe that everything just popped into existence from nothing instead of an eternal being, an eternal sentient mind creating everything. Yeah. Like, so in the beginning, he believes nothing, therefore something, and they believe we, we believe a God, therefore something. I mean – what is more rational to believe that someone creates something or that something creates itself? I mean, yeah. come on. Well, 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 he's well, when we talk about ex nihilo, I don't think we mean literally from nothing, not nothing by no, meaning. I, not I the, definitely not no. Sense, but no prior material. God is the sufficient cause for the beginning. No, of No, and as an idealist, as an idealist, I mean, a monistic idealist, I argue God is caught the fun, fundamental consciousness and that we are just sort of these separate distinctions from God's consciousness. It's not hard to fathom the, how God could create if everything is just a creation of the mind of God. It's for the same yeah. way it's easy to explain how J.R. Tolkien could create the world of Middle Earth. It's the same way. It's just the exact same thing under right? an idealist perspective. But I don't. It's very simple to explain how this could happen. It's not that hard at all. It's much harder to explain how something could pop into existence from nothing on its own. 
And yes. it also goes back to the original idea. Like, so in the beginning, he believes matter just somehow created itself. Maybe there was an eternal substance that was, of course, not sentient that created everything. Okay, well, then how does a first, first cause create something without being sentient? Because there's no natural process which can act upon it to create other stuff. It's the first cause. So it's got to do it by itself. How does it do it that if it's not sentient? Mm. Yeah, and um, th this would get into the claw and, you know, certain theories of time, which I think is way above Godless Engineer said. But um, when, when, when we talk about nothing, we, we mean philosophically speaking, not anything, no properties, no anything like that. So well, if nothing is a causal force, then why don't we see something coming from nothing all the time? Yeah. Like why doesn't don't even try that that stupid that stupid subatomic particles pop into existence from nothing argument? Because no, they pop into existence from a, a vacuum of quantum fluctuations. There's underlying information there on the quantum field. It's yeah. not well, like well, particles are popping into existence from nothing. Yeah, God in, in accordance with a, a, a pre existing set of, of natural laws, yes. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, I mean it's just yeah, and fluctuation. It's a ridiculous it. argument. I mean, I just, I just don't understand how he, like, first of all, when we say ex nihilo, we don't believe literally God created everything from nothing. We would, I would argue God created the universe like the same way. I just prefer eternal mind creating thoughts or creating yeah. a world. Sort of, sort of. There, there is no, prior, like a virtual. no prior material cause, but that does not mean that there is a cause. We are theists. We believe God is the cause. Right. Yeah, there right. is an actual and something I, there I, that I, creates. It's very interesting. Because now, um, I, when when I talked to I am that I am, we had a private conversation. We talked about your argument here, and it essentially goes that matter is not fundamental. We we've had that conversation, but is rather abstraction. Is, is that correct, or am I sort of misrepresenting? Well, it's that? a um, it's I, the best way to do it is explain through analogy. It just sort of arises uh, from underlying information, the same way that a virtual world would arise from underlying computer code. The computer code is not the same as the immersion virtual world in like a video game like Final Fantasy world, but it sort of emerges from that. So in the same way God spoke or thought things into existence, this would be the uh, wave function extended through Hilbert space as defined by the De wheeler dewitt equation and the universe, the physical manifestation would emerge from that uh, upon collapse. So, I mean, I deal with this a lot in my quantum videos, but yeah, the, the uh, physical world would be not so much an abstraction. I wouldn't use that term, but it's just sort of like an emergent, um, as physicists are saying now, like, uh, you know, even Sean Carroll is saying that, you know, space isn't fundamental. It's sort of emergent, sort of emergent from this underlying code, yeah. so to speak, yeah. so to speak. I, I, I love how completely incommensurate our response has been to a uh, godless engineer's actual <laughs> question. I mean, he was arguing from the very lowest levels. And now, now, now we're, we're talking about <laughs> quantum idea. Yeah. 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 Like that, that's, I, I think, wait, first off, he's a Christ. Mythicist, but yeah. you know that that would also be an ad hominem. But I, what, don't, I think don't it's just a Godless engineer. But and, and when you take into account that he believes that some atomic part particles pop into existence out of nothing, then what's irrational about believing God could create something with without prior material and so on? There has never been a paper published that says subatomic particles pop into existence from an absolute nothing. It's always from yeah. the quantum field. There's something there. It's just not material. It's well, not like he, matter. Even uh, if they say that it's from nothing, I think they would be like Lawrence Krauss and would have an agenda in spreading. We will notice Lawrence Krauss. Thank God. Uh, thank God Lawrence Krauss's 15 minutes are up. But I love when he says <laughs> what physicists mean by nothing. No, it's what you what you mean by nothing because nothing is not a, a scientific term. It is a philosophical term yeah, you're exactly. misappropriating. So, yeah, what physicists mean by nothing. No, just shut up, yeah. Well, yeah, and then they, then then they argue that the universe is the special case that nothing can cause to come into being. To you know, try try to avoid the the whole argument of why doesn't everything or anything else pop into existence. And I just argue why doesn't a universe, even though it's special pleading, why doesn't a universe just pop inside our universe? Yeah, yeah. Again, the, the dumbest question I think on this list, or at least poorly phrased. But I Maybe, love yeah, I don't absolute know. cockiness and asking it. <laughs> oh, That's just this thing. I don't understand why he's always got to be like, you know, the overemphasis. I just, dude, just talk normal. Let's just talk normal in your videos. Well, that, that's oh. probably how he normally talks. I hope not. I mean, come on. I, I hope not. I just wish, I well, wish he could start a video like with just like, of course. 
I just wish he could start a video because I watched a whole bunch of videos before I debated him and I got through them. But um, <laughs> I just wish he would have started a video with, with, you know, he always starts up with what's up heathens. Okay, he's just like, what's yeah. up heathens anyway? No, it's always going to be like that overemphasis that I don't even want to try to imitate because. I, it's like, oh, we're, 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 we're being so edgy and insouciant and, you know, it's like a bunch of little snotty 13 year olds, you know? I, I don't have a subscribe motive. It's just annoying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um yeah. Did did you see his article on his website, even though he gives no sources? No. Of where <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry, it's not really right now, no. He claims that an epistle written by um the church father Irenus, I believe, is is um a Gnostic gospel, even though that makes no sense. And then he argues that this is a legend built up from the you know church fathers, even though it was written like during the time of Irenus, obviously. So it won't matter in the first place, but he gives no sources for his historical claims. I'd have to know what passage he's talking about. I'm saying Irenaeus. No, I'm, um, Irenaeus was responding to Gnostics because he was writing towards the end of the second end of the second century, and there were Gnostic groups yeah. that had sprung up. I mean, the Gospel of yeah. Thomas was well, probably written around that same time. So, um, yeah, that would make perfect sense. But, and, I mean, it's not a let. Yeah, and what's funny is um they, they had him on the non-sequitur show a second time because I think they I think the non sequitur show actually think he beat you in that debate which would be funny as hell if they did but um they 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 had him a second time to represent his position on you know did Christ actually exist and he debated uh Christian anarchist which I I think he didn't do as well as you did but he well I don't I don't think that to, to be fair to the non sequitur show I know for example Steve McRae he's not a Christ mythor he he told me so I mean I don't want to I want to show it's clear I don't want to misrepresent them. Okay, cool. I, I didn't know that. I was just simply saying if they do, that's why I say it'll be funny. So, but um, I, I, still at the same time, it, it, I don't know why they they should have got Richard Carrier to debate again, even though they did have him actually debate uh, on the same subject. But Gallus Engineer was more um, prepared. He actually read. He was actually able to name a church father, which was surprising. <laughs> but it's just like then, then he just misrepresented them and ar ar argued a whole non sequitur the entire time. When you can just use the church fathers as the chain of custody if you just take away the Gospels and any other book in the New Testament you would still have enough evidence from their beliefs to show that Christ existed and the basic claims of his deity and so on. But um, I think we should get to the last question. <laughs> Even though we went from, uh, you know, can something come from nothing to, you know, Christ myth? Uh, no, let's, yeah, let's just go because I got to get going soon. Yeah, yeah. Even though this question is 20 minutes. With the basis of our morality, it's as if because we don't have some holy book or we don't worship a god, we have no true way of having a moral compass. Call me crazy, but I don't think you have to have a promise of heaven to see that doing good is just good. Talk about circular reasoning. I believe that doing the most good and the least harm benefits not only me, but those around me. I believe that things like kindness and love not only me, but those around me. However, I also believe that things like judgment, condemnation, and a willful ignorance follow something that has no basis set in reality or backed up by evidence. It's ultimately harmful. And not only to me, but to those around me. So for my question, I'd like to turn the tables. What's the basis for your morality? Is it the Bible? Is it really the Bible? That same Bible that doesn't condemn slavery or rape. Instead, it says things like, your daughter is raped, she should marry her attacker. Or, if you're a slave owner, and you find yourself in a situation where your slave is unruly, you are within your right to beat him within an inch of his life. 
the many scriptures, 66 books filled with thousands of pages. Now he's just improvising. Okay, let's just, okay, first of all, I'm going to clear to you. <laughs> okay. The Bible does condemn rape. Deuteronomy 22, 25, and 27. It clearly says that if a man abs a, or seizes a woman and they are found, the woman should not be put to death, the man shall be. The Bible also condemns any modern definition of slavery in Exodus 21, 16. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put yep, to death. Yep, yep, the, yep. Ancient, the ancient Hebrew word for slave had a much broader definition. You can clearly see this. Because if, for example, your ox runs away in the, in the Mosaic Law, uh, you have to bring it back to the owner. If a slave runs away from his owner, you have to harbor him. You're not supposed – you are – it specifically says do not return him to the owner, but harbor him and keep him safe. Slaves are not property, as the ancient Hebrew word would define it as. You don't have – you can't beat a slave within an inch of his life. Exodus 21 – Yet again, Exodus 21, 26, when a man strikes the eye of a slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out a tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of the tooth. If you hit a slave, you have to let them go free. You're, they, the, most scholars will note this is a broader term to include indentured servants. So if you hit them, their debt is paid. You have to let them go free. So it's not talking about – it doesn't say you can beat slaves legally. Yeah, go for it. No, it clearly says you can't do that. You have to let them go. So, no, I mean, just re read it. So, uh, I mean, K Kyle, I, first of all, I love Kyle. Kyle, if you're listening, I love you. You're, I think he's a guy. I wish I could sit down with him and have a glass of whiskey because he's actually a pretty funny guy. But come on, just don't try this, man. It, it's right there. I can pull up so many other places. Uh, anyone else want to add anything? Because I think he – well, we, we should probably talk about uh, the moral argument and so on. That yeah, was I, question, but, well, for example, I don't well, know what category he's in. I mean, he's trying to jump in between normative ethics, meta ethics, and metaphysics a lot. Uh, I, I think you should just bring it down a notch because I think that's uh, maybe not above Kyle's head, but above like people like Gaulus. Well, and first of all, talking about basis for morality, if you're gonna, well, what's your basis for morality? Okay, well, if we're in normative ethics, it's virtue ethics, if it's meta ethics, it's moral realism. If we're talking about the ontological foundation of moral realism, okay, it's theism. There has to be a necessary rational source. But I mean, no one, no one argues that if you're an atheist, you can't have a moral compass. No one says that. Just why, do, why have that moral compass in the first place, and why do these things exist? Is it the neo-Darwinian evolutionary process where morality could have just evolved like growing five fingers or two, two ears? Well, yeah, but then you would still fail to have a prescriptive uh, uh, morality. Yeah, that too. Morality. Well, I mean, well, the, 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 the question seems to be, what's your basis for morality? Oh, I have to ask what subject, normative ethics? It's virtue ethics. If we're talking about the argument we give for the moral argument is given ethics, given what we know, that, you know about these moral truths, why do they exist? It's not what the basis for morality. It's why do they exist? What's the ontological yeah. meaning of this? And that's the moral argument. No one says atheists can't have a moral compass. And so if, if he's asking what's our moral foundation, well, again, I need to know what subject he's talking about. I mean, I, the Bible would be yet yeah, included, but I mean, it would have to be taken in full context with the scholarship on it. And again, as Paul says in Galatians 5.14, you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. So that's the basis of my morality. Then. Well, um, I think the first... For, for the ultimate morality, I think it's to love God with our all our soul, mind, strength, and heart, and so on. And then and then that's the second commandment. But yeah, I agree with that as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and that would preclude that would uh, preclude you know uh, slavery in in the you know, you know plantation slavery sense. Yeah, yeah, it, plantation slavery is completely outlawed according to Exodus twenty one sixteen. Yeah, but the, every scholar, even someone like Christine Hayes, who doesn't even think Moses existed. Very liberal scholar will note, you know, if you read the Levitical law in context, it's actually quite revolutionary for its time. And, you know, she gets a lot of these things as well. I mean, the term for slave had a much broader term. I just watch her series on Open University. I don't agree with everything she says, but she's she's clearly looked at this a lot. She notes a lot of good things about the Levitical law that a lot of people who haven't, re haven't really looked into it that much haven't noticed. I Yeah, I, I love when they, when they argue why doesn't the Ten Commandments – condemn slavery or rape but then you realize the ninth commandment is don't covet and when you covet 
for a woman's you know sexuality and so on without her consent. That's essentially bringing the ninth commandment along with slavery as well. What's well, your, no what's your that says you shouldn't boil your cat. I mean, there's no commandment that says you can't hit someone with a car. It's supposed to you can't. This is not supposed to cover literally every human example. Yeah, all the laws summed up in one thing: you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. That covers everything. Don't rape. Don't enslave. Don't murder. Yep. But I mean, that's what. What else is there to say? Yeah. But I think he's trying to really ask, <clears throat> "What's your foundation for your morality?" And yeah. I, I would really encourage him to study philosophy of ethics, like study metaethics, normative ethics. These are different categories. It's hard to really say unless we're talking about what category. And the foundation for my morality is it depends on the, the subject. Mm. Yeah, and, and essentially the grounding for our morality is in, I don't know if IP would agree with me, but I would argue it's in the unchanging nature of God, who is a, the grace conceivable being, who is yeah, uh, I agree. perfect, okay, cool, perfect, loving, well, all good, and so on. Yeah, but that's the, that's the metaphysical foundation. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't say, I don't you know, my, it, it's really kind of confused because it's kind of it's kind of a confusing question because he, as I said, sometimes he's jumping between different categories here. But what's your? He's like you know, it's the foundation of your morality, the Bible. I mean, to some degree, yeah, because it, you know, obviously it has commandments in there that I follow. But if I'm, you're going to ask me what's your normative normative ethical foundation, I'm going to say virtue ethics because I think that's what the Bible teaches. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'll, 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 I I actually want to watch your series on um ethics of not belief but morality, of course, because um I I'm I'm mostly familiar with uh, Craig's moral argument, which I think is sufficient enough for the. Lady. I don't like his at all. In fact, I attack. I don't think his argument's that good, and because a lot of atheists have attacked it, and I kind of agree with the criticism. I don't think his argument explains enough. So I have two videos. I have the moral argument, and then I have a follow up called "Is God the Same as Moral Goodness?" And I sort of explain why god is the foundation for well you, we, yeah yeah you you would agree though that if god does not exist and objective morality does not exist or objective moral duties yeah i do but i just don't i don't like the way craig words it i don't think it says what wants it to say he needs to give more details yeah yeah well, sure. well, craig, craig always puts the syllogism uh, uh, first and foremost you know so yeah it's a syllogism which of course you have to go into more detail of what he argues for and so on. And I think you could probably make a better case for him because he obviously he's the great defender of the claw because that was his dissertation at Birmingham, I believe, or the or Talbot, whatever, one of those two schools. Uh, uh, again, you, you, you could probably um, refute it in that sense, but of course no new atheist layman could refute that simple syllogism because they can't even form a, a lot of them came in form of valid syllogism. Well, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't define what God is in the argument. I think that's the biggest thing. So that's what I focus most on my moral argument. Yeah, well, right? yeah, we don't... details are important, but of course, it, yeah, he he could write out full sororities, but I think if you have, I if you can defend both premises in detail, then I think it's good enough. So yeah, I, I think we answered those questions. Oh. I am the I am. Do you have anything else to add on? <clears throat> yeah, I just think that they're clueless that it was it was a, a dead servitude. It was like a socioeconomic system they and uh, in, instituted in there to keep out poverty. I can't believe they didn't know that. So, well, they well, also to me it's disingenuous for sure. Yeah. Well, also there's something interesting that most Christians don't even know about political law. But if you read scholars on this, like Christine Hayes or John Walton. They will note the Levitical law is not a set of like law codes like we have today. It's more aligned with like a treaty on like judicial or moral wisdom. It's right. not. It's meant to be didactic. Law codes were exhortational, not prescriptive. They were expressing the moral importance of something, not giving bare minimal sentences and punishment. So well, the, the, if you the, look up law code didactic, I mean, you'll see that this is what scholars have written about the Levitical law, how it's similar to the Code of Hammurabi or the you know the Hittite law codes. It's yeah. not prescriptive. It's didactic. It's exhortational. So, yeah, yeah when they say, Yo, you shall stone them to death and you shall show them no mercy, it, it, it is an exaggeration. It, it, is, it is kind of saying this is very serious. It's expressing the more importance. Yeah, it's not a minimal sentence. In fact, we don't even have zero evidence these were, the, the Levitical law was used in a court of law that it was yeah. ever prescribed as a It's a schoolmaster. 
Yeah, yeah I, basically, yeah. It's and, and I'm not saying this. Go read all the scholars who have read about <laughs> the Levitical law. I mean, they all say this. Yes. Well, that now now they're going to argue. Why couldn't God just make it easier to understand? It's just like so. You, so you actually seek him with a sincere heart and actually want to study the information and so on. If you're not willing to go that far, then it's just like, well, why are you even asking these questions? Yeah, well, it was also easy God to understand dumb it culture. down to the absolute lowest level? Well, also, it, it was written to that culture. It was easy to understand that culture. We should study yeah. the culture, not just assume every culture has our culture. A text cannot mean what never meant, which is the basis basics of exegesis, which everyone needs to learn for reading any text. Yes, I think I think I think that's it. Yeah, I think we answered the questions somewhat well, necessarily and sufficiently. So, all right. Well, I'm going to take off. I got to yep. go take care of some things. But thanks yeah, for having yeah. me. Th thanks, Rob. Yeah, it was nice talking to you guys. Have a good night, IP. Thanks, you too. Boy. Yes, and so I I, I just want to say it is it is a disgraceful. We're, we're what 10 12 years into the new atheist revolution and and this kind of puerile grade school uh, uh uh hs is the best they can do it's it's just it's really a disgrace yeah and uh, man i, I so the, the the first question is the most interesting question but then they literally ask the same question 50 times in the video. yeah <laughs> how do you know? How do you know you're correct? How, how do you know all these other religions are false and so on? Of course, I haven't gone through the Roman pantheon. Well, one thing with the Roman pantheons of gods, they're attributed to the eternal universe. So I think we know that not to be the case. But I, I haven't gone through the tribal gods and so on. But I think when you look into them, the major claims are just false overall. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I talk about this in one of my videos. <laughs> we don't even need to go over this too much, but yeah, I mean, there are, you know, even the pagan gods really aren't necessarily uh, mutually exclusive with with uh, believing in in a, in a uh, timeless, immaterial first cause. So it's it's a complete non-argument to begin with, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and uh, man. Just some of these questions were loaded first off with too many presuppositions. <laughs> Usually it's two or three, but with some of them, there were like a thousand presuppositions. I thought in <laughs> Kyle's question, I could barely hear him. I thought he was really just shoveling them in. I mean, I thought, why should I base my morality on something for which there's no evidence? It's like, it's like, <laughs> we're just like, should, should we have that conversation first? And if we can't get past that, then why are you asking your question? Yeah, yeah. So, oh yes, it, it, and then they circ they circle right back to it. Even when we say I don't agree with the premise that there is no evidence, they'll they'll circle right back and say, "Well, well why is there? Why do are you asking me to believe something for which there is no evidence?" The the yeah. evidence for their claim that there is no evidence for God would have to be they would have to refute every argument in existence for the existence of God, which. At least new atheists have not done that. I've come across at least not not only every any argument that that has been presented, any argument that could be presented. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. Well. <laughs> it, unless you could have some a priori way of of just kind of uh, eliminating all of them, but I don't I don't see how you would do such a thing. Arguments are evidence. <sighs> <laughs> well, there, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they will literally they will literally discount logic as 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 a way of of knowing true things. It's 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 ridiculous. Why well, should I accept that statement that you know uses yeah. presupposes logic in the first place? Oh, IP just left yeah. without evidence. Well, I I, I think I think well, this is it. I mean, I think we should wrap it up here. Yeah. Um. Is there any closing thoughts you want to have? Uh, I am. I am. Yeah, like, um, <clears throat> like I mean, I'm, I disdain that argument about the slavery. All you have to do is read Exodus twenty-one three. It tells you right there that they were able to come in on their own and leave on their own. How could you misconstrue that? Mm. Mm. <clears throat> well, and you have. The I mean, it's just blatant right there. Yeah, and, and, and it's a paying off a of debt. So when they pay off that debt, of course. Or you know, right. well, it's debt servitude. It's it's just yeah. like an NBA team just giving a contract to another team. That's all it is. 
Well, I won't use that example because obviously the NBA they have a lot more rights and they get fifty million dollars. <laughs> yeah, I was going to well, say no, no, but actually that's wrong though because if you read Deuteronomy twenty five, I think it is they're allowed to leave on their own. They can they can leave out. I'll, I'll have to look up Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25. Stuff. I have I have some good posts on my profile. I want you to see, uh, check it out, JD. Cool, cool. Yeah, just send it to me. Your, your yeah, it, see, it seems like you're asking, especially the question from a very privileged first world perspective where they're completely blind yeah. to how the vast majority of humanity lived throughout the vast majority of history, you know? Exactly. But yes. So I enjoyed this. Yep. Thanks yeah, for uh, making. Yeah. So um, I'll 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 end the stream now. So uh, thanks for watching this video, everyone. Uh, please leave a like, subscribe, and share. And uh, I left my article. If you want, even though I think we answered, gave quick responses and good answers. If you want to see more detailed answers in my article, then a link is in the description to that below. And there's also another article that uh, a com. Uh, a collab uh, collaboration of many Christian apologists have done on uh, S.J. Tomanson's um, website. It's like a it, in the document it was like thirty-seven pages, single space. So if if they actually read that, who made the video, then I would be at least I'll give respect. But if they don't even bother to read that, then they're not really seeking answers for their questions. But um, yeah, if you want more details on how to answer these questions, which are basically the most, most basic atheist, new atheist questions, then uh, definitely check out those and um, check out Rob's channel, Deflating Atheism. Uh, check out I Am The I Am's uh, Instagram page. He's done a couple of videos for my channel. And, um, and God bless. Inspiring and philosophy. God bless, guys. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Inspi obviously, inspiring philosophy as well. That That's pretty smooth. <laughs> yep. So, uh, God bless, everyone. God bless. God bless.